Chapter 67 Next In the morning, Harry returned alone to see Ambrose, as they had discussed the previous evening. He followed him into his study, and they sat by the fire. Harry realised it was always lit and at an appropriate level of warmth. Although he had not felt it, magic must be at work in that fireplace. It was obviously Ambrose's old magic. He smiled to himself, taking the cup of tea the elder gentleman offered him. Did the students get back to Hogwarts all right? he asked Ambrose. They did indeed, Ambrose said. They went to sleep here and woke up in their respective beds at school. Their classmates and most of their teachers will be unaware they have been away. The companions will not be able to discuss their adventures, other than among themselves and those of you who accompanied them into the first part of the ante world. All in all, a rather involved piece of magic. It took me a good minute. What about Freddy? Harry asked. How do you explain away his disappearance? Ah, the time-honoured classic excuse of dragonpox, Ambrose said with a wry smile. He was taken ill in the night and sent home to his parents. Minerva will announce his passing to the school in a few days, and he will be commemorated. His family, of course, will continue to remember the true story. Any less would be unthinkable. He deserves to be remembered as a hero. He was very special and much loved. Harry remarked. I thought him a splendid fellow from the very beginning, Ambrose mused. That was a gross underestimation of his qualities. He was, in a sense, a genius. But Freddy was a genius of love. Who else would have thought not only to give up himself, but also to surrender the ultimate weapon to those it was designed to harm? He loved his own world, and that of his supposed enemies. All the abilities I have, Harry, that one ability of his outshines them all. And after all the wonderful and hilarious times we spent together, I shall miss him as I miss my own children. Ambrose paused and sipped his tea in silence. Was there another reason you asked me here today, Ambrose? Harry prompted, after a decent time. There was indeed, my dear fellow, Ambrose continued. I wonder if you'd deliver this for me. It is for George, really, but you might want to gather all of Ginny's family when you present it to him. He handed Harry a package wrapped in brown paper and red string. It was the size of a diary. It will be larger once you open it, Ambrose explained. This is a portrait of Fred Weasley, which I painted. I have been known to dabble. Harry looked at him. Have you ever been known not to dabble? Touché, Harry, Ambrose conceded. When does this mean you knew beforehand that Fred was going to die? Harry demanded to know. In this case, Ambrose replied, I also dabbled in a little time travel, because I had not known beforehand. I went back, observed Fred, and painted him, infusing the portrait with his personality. It was actually quite easy, because he had so much personality. I thought you were against time travel, Harry noted. I am against inexpert people's time travelling without due caution, Ambrose corrected. However, I am an expert and unutterably prudent. Harry scoffed and smiled. This will be amazing for the whole family, but especially for George. Thank you, Ambrose. Ambrose beamed. I'm delighted to help, my dear friend. Please send my love to all the Weasleys. What will you do next, Ambrose? Harry asked. Ambrose looked thoughtful. I believe I may have a cup of tea and several biscuits. Harry tried again. I was thinking further ahead than that. Ah, Ambrose smiled. That would make rather more sense. I plan to reside here at the old rectory with Lydia and her parents until either Lydia is launched upon her adult life or until the family implores me to find alternative accommodation. After that, I shall do as I usually do, change my appearance, and set out to find fresh adventures. If the matter you and I discussed, Harry, comes to pass, I may approach you and apprise you of my new identity. Other than that eventuality, I shall become unknown to both magical and muggle communities. I shall be merely another face in the crowd, until such time as I am needed once more. 
there is a scant possibility that Fredlington's presence and actions in the altar world may lead to a reconciliation between our two worlds. There is in that case a further spindly possibility that my existence may no longer be required, and I might be released from this endless mortal coil. Who knows? If that comes to pass, and I come to pass, as it were, I should dearly like to say my farewells. However, death, I have noted, is seldom so obliging or dignified. Ambrose poured himself another cup of tea, and took his biscuit from the cake stand. He raised it to his mouth, then lowered it, and put it on the edge of his saucer. "'I would counsel against thinking your troubles are over, Harry,' Ambrose said. "'The connection to the altar world has closed. The Laurie Rackerson is no more. Thorfinn Roald is in Azkaban, awaiting trial. Yet you do well to remember that the schemes which the Watcher had wrought through them may still be under way. Human agents might be working on ways to destabilise the wizarding world and muggle governments. There is a shift in the world's mood, against tolerance and towards hatred. If that were to coincide with wizards and muggles coming into conflict, some great calamity could still befall us all. Pestilence, famine and war may be just around the corner. Back at Hogwarts, Lydia and her school friends resumed their former lives. They went to lessons, studied, and hung out together. Lydia felt a strange sense of emptiness. She was closer to her friends than ever before, especially Sophie and Oddie. But Xander and Freddy were no longer with them. Lydia's dad, Jim, was at the old rectory. He spent most of his time in his human guise. He and Catherine were planning their wedding for the summer holidays, so that all their friends could attend. Lydia was counting the days until the Easter break, and she could get to know him. Freddy, the school had been told, was at home with Dragonpox. This rendered it near impossible for the other companions to grieve his loss as they would wish. After a week, Professor McGonagall announced his death in a special assembly. This, perversely, made it easier for Lydia and her friends. Not only could they talk about losing him, but they could also feel happier than their schoolmates, knowing that he was not dead. Lydia dreamed about him at night. These were not the vivid dreams the Watcher had sent her before, but she felt they were more than the usual rearrangement of memories and ideas, which led to normal dreams. They were connections, however vague, with Freddy himself. She gained the impression that Freddy was happy, well-liked, and making new friends. Lydia and her companions saw Professor Verdin Hogsmeade one weekend, with Lavender. They looked happy together, Lydia was delighted to see that Lavender was keeping Stefano on his toes. Jimmy and Corbin were still close, but being discreet while at school. Shona and Dean were hanging out with each other, but not dating. Christy started spending time with Melba Anderson, Oddie's big sister, who was a Gryffindor seventh-year prefect and a friend of Freddy's cousin, Fenella. Christy had a crush on Melba, but Oddie had to let her down gently. Melba had a boyfriend. Who lived in the region around Hogwarts. Resigning herself to being an adoring friend to Melba, Christy became a kind of mascot to the older Gryffindors. Oddie gained a lot of respect from all for the sensitivity he had shown to Christy. Teddy Lupin hung with Lydia and her friends in the joint common room most evenings. He paid a lot of attention to Shona for a while, but became intimidated by Dean's constant presence. Dev also spent time with Shona, but only as a friend. However, it was through Shona that he came to know Maisie Hopkirk, another of Lydia and Shona's dorm mates. The two of them got on well. Maisie was in awe of Dev's intelligence and skills, and Dev had found self-confidence through their adventures in the anteworld. She was no slouch academically, she was a Ravenclaw after all, and she had a quiet manner which suited Dev. Whether they would ever come around to having a romantic relationship Nobody knew. The consensus was that it would be foolish to hold your breath while waiting to find out. Teddy, once stayed away from Shona by Dean, spent his time with Lydia, whom he had known the longest. He seemed keen on her, and dating looked like it was on his mind. Oddie said nothing either way, but Lydia felt that dating Teddy would be a terrible mistake. Then, 
thinking about Oddie's speech at the old rectory, she realised that such a mistake might be exactly what she needed. But it would wait until after Easter. Easter at the old rectory was quiet without Freddy. Ambrose had invited Oddie, old friends as they were. Sophie, her mum and Nana Inkwood were there as usual. The big difference was that Jim was with them all, in place of Xander. The weather was unusually cold for the time of year, but it was dry and sunny and ideal for walking. Jim took Lydia, Sophie and Oddie for walks around the woods he had used to patrol as a cat. Catherine went with them once or twice, and Elsa, Sophie's cat, followed Jim almost everywhere. Jim could barely sit down in the house before Elsa would spring purring into his lap. One sunny day they discovered the swimming pool in an immense conservatory at the back of the rectory. Lydia and Sophie had frequently used the pool during the summer holidays, where it had been outdoors. It had moved indoors because of the cooler weather. They had great fun diving and swimming, after which they lay sunbathing on lounges, while Fenton served them mocktails. Lydia felt embarrassed when she caught herself noticing how athletic Oddie was becoming since the beginning of their quest. When Jim and Nana Inkwood arrived in swimwear, the students absented themselves, much to Nana Inkwood's amusement. Most evenings they had visitors. Harry and Ginny came several times with and without the children. Professors McGonagall, Flitwick and Verdi all visited on different days. Verdi brought lavender, or it may have been the other way round. It upset Lydia that Draco didn't visit. Harry had told them about the rift between him and Draco. Lydia could understand why Draco felt rejected after the treatment he and his family had received from the Aurors. He'd been all right with her at school, every bit as friendly as usual. But Harry was not staying at the old rectory, nor any of his Aurors, and her own family and friends were not typical magical citizens. She wished Draco could have at least asked about visiting. Then she realised what it must be. The only thing it could be. Harry had told her how Draco had blamed him for getting them involved in the campaign which had led to his wife's blood curse. But Harry had not started the chain of events. Ultimately that had been down to Ambrose, they now knew. Ambrose had tried to remove Astoria's curse, but had only been partly successful. Draco had taken against Ambrose, she reasoned. Lydia could sympathise. She had been furious with the old warlock before, had felt used, manipulated and unloved. But she understood the depth of Ambrose's pain and guilt. She knew Ambrose felt trapped in a perpetual cage of his own making. Ambrose was as much a victim as she or Draco, even as much as Astoria, though in a different way. She missed Draco's gentle manner, whatever the reason. Ambrose received a message from Professor McGonagall, near the end of the Easter holiday. Draco had tendered his resignation. He would continue to teach until the end of the academic year. McGonagall would have to find a replacement by September. They were all saddened by Draco's decision, but Lydia felt she could understand. She resolved to find or create a chance to speak with him once they were back at school. But Lydia didn't intend to change his mind. She wanted to support him. I wish you could come with me, Dad, Lydia whispered as she hugged him. Well, I couldn't go as myself, he said as he released her. And I've spent quite enough time as a cat for one lifetime. Maybe in the next eight. She grinned. Jim turned and hugged Sophie. Catherine hugged Oddie. Look after my little girl for me, Oddie, she told him. Of course, Mrs. Ward, he laughed. Though she is pretty good at fending for herself, you know. I know said Catherine. But don't let anyone insult her. I've heard some boys who can be quite catty. They all looked at Jim. Ah, shut up, you reprobates, he grumbled. I'll go off onto the train. Don't forget to brush your hair, Mr. Ward, said Oddie. You don't want to go floofy again. The girls, including Catherine, giggled. Oddie's shoulders jiggled. If only Ambrose had given me powers, Jim muttered. You merely underline the wisdom of my decision not to do so, Ambrose pointed out. Ambrose turned to address the youngsters. I need not exhort you to work hard. 
for I know you to be the most annoyingly diligent students it has ever been my fate to encounter. But I will ask you to remember to enjoy yourselves. Give my regards to all your friends and to teachers. Now, be about your business. They mounted the carriage steps and found a compartment from which they could wave to their families. Teddy joined them, followed by Shona and Dean. As the train pulled out of King's Cross, Lydia sat and thought back to the very start of her adventures. She remembered the times she had sworn to find her father, or to find what had happened to him. She also remembered thinking it would take a miracle. It had taken several miracles by her old standards. One to gain her powers, another to get through the Ante world, and one more to beat the Watcher and his champion. That miracle had been called Freddy. The End <laughs>